Um, all right, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today are um, our efforts to try to use a wavelet transform analysis to get some extra structural information out of some small discrete molecular systems. Um, I'm going to tell you about places where things have gone well and also places where things have kind of failed. Um, so let's see here. So we're all uh, familiar with um, modeling um, XAVS data within the single scattering approximation. Um, so basically sum of individual contributions. And we're also fairly acquainted with the limitations of this analysis. So um, best cases, uh, number of atoms that you can distinguish within any given shell is plus or minus one. Um, you have resolution um, um, limitations, so how resolvable two shells are of similar atomic um, weight um, based on the quality of your data out to high energy. So for example, although you could resolve uh, the shell designated by the blue peak from the one in the orange here, um, distinguishing the blue from the green scatters here would be impossible. Um, as far as atomic number goes, plus or minus four, best case scenario. And if we have uh, two scatters of similar distance, it, that uh, the uh, large atomic number is gonna dominate that. And this really presents a lot of problems for the types of systems that I study. Um, so we deal with small discrete molecular systems. Um, a lot of these are in a biological context and we're also interested in studying reactive intermediates. Um, so a lot, some of these issues that we encounter are low concentrations giving us poor signal to noise. Um, we get buildup of side reactions, um, so side products that oftentimes aren't so minor and being able to distinguish that from the species of interest is a huge issue a lot of times. Uh, because of the nature of the systems that we study, so invisol rings, um, CO and CN ligands, um, we have significant contributions from multiple scattering pathways that often complicate the analysis. And we also have significant outer sphere contributions that also overlap. So we're always trying to think of ways to overcome some of these issues that we encounter. Um, so for me, an ideal solution uh, would be to be able to distinguish between similar structural models with shells of similar distance and atomic weight, um, to be able to distinguish multiple scattering pathways from noise, things like that. Um, we want to have an analysis that we can actually extract quantitative structural information from um, in distinguishing these similar structures and not simply see that one looks better than the other. Um, and most importantly for us, because we don't really write code to any great extent, is that we need something that's going to easily integrate into our own um, XAVS fitting routines. So, um, quite some time ago, um, I saw this study that really got my um, attention concerning wavelet use in um, analyzing XAVS data. And in this particular study, um, the authors used a FEF Morlay wavelet um, to build a series of functions to help distinguish between different scatterers in um, essentially the secondary coordination shells. So here, um, using this approach, uh, these authors were able to unambiguously determine that out here at high R, um, one shell contained only zinc interactions and these zinc aluminum layered double hydroxides, while another shell was comprised of both zinc and aluminum interactions. And this seemed like it would be an incredibly useful approach to us, but um, it didn't really meet my requirement that it was easily integratable into our XSAVs fitting routines. Um, but it got my uh, attention um, turned towards the idea of using wavelets in an XSAVs analysis. And this study really got us interested in using a wavelet transform for an XSAVs analysis.
So there are two reasons why this study caught my eye. Number one is that by using a continuous wavelet transform, the authors were able to distinguish between noise and multiple scattering pathways at high R. And this is something that my group has been having trouble with in some of the systems that we've been analyzing. Furthermore, the type of wavelet transform that they perform could easily be integrated into my XS fitting routines. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to talk about what a wavelet um, transform is versus a standard Fourier transform. So we're all familiar with Fourier transforms in XAVS analysis. So essentially you apply um, your, um, your complex um, wave function to your XAVS data. You get, an, you get the conversion from K space to R space. But when you do this, because of the nature of the Fourier transform, you lose information um, in K space when you transform to R space. Specifically, the nature of the various peaks in your Fourier transform, you don't know where those are maximizing in K space. And this can be solved by using a wavelet analysis. So a wavelet, you basically just have your complex wave um, function, which is multiplied through by a Gaussian. So what the wavelet function looks like is this, where essentially um, you have this weighted towards a particular part of your overall signal in K space, and that will then multiply through. And you can tell that a specific peak that you get in your radial distribution function corresponds to a certain part in the actual um, K space uh, spectrum. So that we're, we don't lose the information the other part of the spectrum because typically you like to use all of your data. You can do a continuous wavelet transform in which you apply this in discrete steps across the whole um, K space spectrum. When you do this, you get a two dimensional plot where you can see that individual peaks in your Fourier transform are corresponding to certain amplitudes in your K space spectrum at a specific region in K space. And this is really valuable in terms of analyzing this from an XAVS analysis because we can start to pick out that these particular scatterers in the shells are coming from certain scattering pathways. So for example, nickel oxygen, nickel chlorine, multiple scattering pathways, um, outer sphere heavy atom pathways can all be easily distinguished in theory by doing this type of a transform. So just to show the utility of a wavelet transform, I'm going to go back to that previous study that I introduced where using a Cauchy continuous wavelet transform, the authors are able to distinguish between noise and multiple scattering pathways in some aqueous gold chloride exas. In that study, the authors also looked at the exas of thorite at the thorium L3 edge, and they are able to readily distinguish between different scatterer types throughout the Fourier transform, for example, distinguishing inner sphere oxygens, outer sphere thoriums, and all at around 3.8 angstroms, unambiguously assigning that peak is occurring from silicon and thorium scatterers. Now, there are two things that I want to point out. Number one is that most of the studies that have taken advantage of a wavelet transform applied to XAVs have been done on these solid state samples where there's heavy atoms in the outer coordination sphere. In those cases, a wavelet transform is incredibly advantageous because in the 2D portion of the wavelet transform, those heavy atom scatterers really light up. The other thing that I want to point out is that LARCH contains a wavelet transform analysis, and the wavelet transform that's utilized in LARCH is the one that was used in this particular study. It's a Cauchy continuous wavelet transform. So this particular paper, though, really caught my eye. Um, so uh, most of the applications of using a wavelet transform in XAVS analysis are in solid state materials type samples, where you have lots of heavy atom scatterers in 
the outer coordination shell. Um, here in this study, um, the use of um, the wavelet transform was used with small molecules. And you can see that at least qualitatively, um, you can see differences uh, between different compounds in that wavelet transform. And you can see differences between single scatterer and multiple scattering pathways. And I'm gonna get back to what the difference is between these two when we get in and start talking about resolution in a wavelet transform. Um, but before we do that, um, I'm gonna see if there are any questions at this point. Yeah, thank you. There, there's a few. Um, one is, uh, there's a question about how do you choose which wavelet basis to use? Um, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, what we use, um, so we use a Morlay mother wavelet. And the reason that we use that um, for a number of different reasons, but mostly is that the envelope of that function matches the envelope of a K cubed XAB spectrum pretty well. So we use one that kind of mimics the shape of the data fairly well. Okay. Um, there's also a comment uh, that filtering and back transforming also shows you where the amplitude of a shell is maximum. Mm -hmm. um, anything you want to add to that? Um, no, I'll take that as a uh, comment at this point. Um, <laughs> so... All right, very good. You should continue, please. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, this is the form of a wavelet transform. You can see it looks like a Fourier transform. Um, we have the XAVS data, the mother wavelet. Um, the particular mother wavelet that we're going to use is a Morlay mother wavelet. Um, and just to show you what this mother wavelet looks like, um, we have these two examples here. So in your mother wavelet, you have two adjustable parameters. You have the um, eta parameter and the sigma parameter, which dictate um, the frequency of the wave as well as the shape of the Gaussian. These are adjustable parameters and they're gonna influence the resolution that you have in two-dimensional space, okay? So, um, Getting to resolution, we have to worry about both resolution in R and K space in these um, two-dimensional transforms. And these are going to be inversely related um, and are going to be based on those sigma and eta parameters, as well as the um, spot that you are in your actual data in terms of R. So uh, the resolution varies across the transform. Um, just to give you an example, as you gain resolution in K space, you're going to lose resolution in R space. As you gain resolution in R space, inversely, you're going to lose resolution in K space. And this is going to have um, ramifications as far as the data analysis that I'm going to go through and show you later in the talk when we actually get through um, and I show you examples of how we're using this. Um, so getting back to this, I chose these two parameters because in that paper, using the Morlay wavelet approach to study small discrete molecular species, these were the two um, sets of parameters that were used. Um, and you can see how they influence the data. So in one case, you get a very nice resolution in R space, but you're losing your resolution in K space. So it's difficult to distinguish scatterer types, but you get a nice resolution to scatterer distances. Inversely, you can go and increase your resolution to be able to better distinguish scatterer types, but you're gonna lose that resolution as far as distance goes. Um, to show you some simulations of data that we look at and how those parameters influence us, um, I just simulated a nickel nitrogen and a nickel sulfur bond length um, over a specific K range. This gives us a delta R of 0.13 angstroms. If we do that Morlay transform, um, keeping the delta R about the same as what you would get through a traditional Fourier transform analysis, um, we can really nicely distinguish between the nickel nitrogen and the nickel sulfur scatterer. 
as you increase your resolution in R space, you lose it in K space. So you gain a little bit in R space, but you're starting to blur these out and it's gonna become more difficult to distinguish between scatterer types. Um, so there's various approaches that you can use. Uh, the ones that I have in red are ones that we have used to varying degrees of su success. Um, when we're actually modeling off of the wavelet transform, what we use is a medium resolution on delta R and delta K. Additionally, we've used scaling parameters that have fed our needs. We've done two different transforms, one giving us high delta R, another giving us high delta K in separate refinements. Um, in order to solve this problem of uh, variable resolution across the spectrum. Um, some people have taken cues from the signal processing literature and used available scaling parameter. Um, so for example here, you can see that by using a variable scaling parameter, um, you can clean up some features in the wavelet transform. You can get some multiple scattering features at high R that begin to become apparent that aren't when you don't do this. This doesn't do anything as far as the inherent resolution of the transform, it just cleans up the data some. And this is something that we haven't um, used um, in our analyses. So the approach that we use to model our data is we start with uh, just an initial um, model to the XAVs uh, just through standard methods. Um, that's always our first starting point where we come up with one or more valid fits to the XAVs data. From there, we'll either um, refine off of the wavelet transform using that initial data. What we typically do is we'll refine both R and sigma squared. Um, sometimes we'll restrain that sigma square parameter if we're interested in high resolution in R space. Um, some drawbacks to this is that, number one, your initial guess has to be really good, at least in our hands. Um, in our hands, refinements off of the wavelet transform has a tendency to go awry, and you can find yourself into physically meaningless refinements fairly easily. Um, we've also found that the number of scatterers, we really have to keep that restrained. When we let that float, um, the refinement becomes essentially a random number generator and we get into really weird solutions. Also, if you need to know your atoms to a high degree of R, or if you need to know your, if you want high accuracy in R, you need to know what the atoms are beforehand and keep those restrained. And I'll go through one of the, um, examples that I'm going to show is really going to emphasize that later on. Um, second strategy that we've used, if strategy one doesn't work, um, is essentially we'll take our XAVs data and we'll come up with a large number of reasonable structures. We'll take those FEF bait, we'll take those structures and we'll perform FEF calculations to simulate what the data should look like for all of those different structures. We then do a wavelet transform on those and score those relative to the experimental data. So essentially we're using a library of um, uh, theoretically derived wavelet transforms to match to our experimental data. Um, and we don't do a refinement on the wavelet transform per se. Um, the third strategy is to just admit defeat and stick with a non-wavelet transform analysis. Um, sad to say that this is the strategy that we often find ourselves using more often than not. Um, so in all cases, um, the error model that we use is basically, it's essentially a reduce um, chi-squared. Um, analysis on the complex 2D wavelet transform over the uh, K and R space that we use in the wavelet transform. So let's see here. Um, that is at that point, and I'm gonna go into data analysis using these three strategies um, coming up. But are there questions at this point? Uh, we'll give people just a minute to see if they want to, uh, if they want to type something in. 
Um, uh, thank you for putting together all of the, uh, uh, the talk and all of the figures showing uh, the different applications. This has been really informative for me. All right, we'll hold on questions for now then, and you should continue, please. Okay, so um, what I've done is I've gone through and I've just taken three different cases that we've um, used to highlight um, strategy one, strategy two, and I guess how you'd call it a pseudo strategy three. Um, so in one case, uh, we have, we were examining um, some intermediates that were formed in these cobalt-based oxidation reactions. So in these cobalt-based oxidation reactions, you start with a formally cobalt-2 species. You um, oxidize this in a presence of a Lewis acid, and you can form some intermediate that facilitates oxidation reactions. And I have this as a black box, not because I'm trying to hide the structure or a proposed structure, but because the chemistry of this is really much more black box than um, me and my collaborators would like to admit. There's a huge number of unknowns involving this. Um, if you look at what the oxidation products are and the um, precursors, what makes most sense for this is that you would have some formal cobalt 4 oxo species that's doing these oxidation reactions. Um, so this is what makes most sense. Um, so this raises the question, are we forming this cobalt oxo type species, um, which would be interesting in its own right. There's some reasons to doubt that these can actually be formed. Um, and also, why do we have to have a Lewis acid present? Is that Lewis acid binding to some place in this cobalt oxo complex? So what we did was we analyzed a number of these intermediates. I'm going to show you data for the uh, scandium derivative, but this um, gives us similar results if we use different Lewis acids in here. So we're examining this. If you look at the Zanes, um, so here I'm comparing this with um, the oxidized four coordinate compound, which is actually a cobalt three ligand radical species. What you see is a shift in the edge. You also see an increase in the 1s to 3d transition, suggesting that we've gone from square, pla or square planar to some five coordinate square pyramidal type complex. So consistent with the formation of this axial ligand for the active oxidant. We can go through and get very nice models of the XAVS data. Um, what we come up with are two best models, um, involve, all involve a short cobalt oxygen bond length. Um, cobalt nitrogens are in there. We have a large number of outer sphere um, carbon interactions, ligand-based multiple scattering pathways, and we can also identify co a cobalt scandium scattering pathway. In both models, these are in the 3.2 to 3.3 angstrom bond length. In one model, um, we've included in a multiple scattering pathway for a cobalt oxygen scandium multiple scattering pathway. And I'm going to show you the structures that we can get from models one and two. Um, when we include this pathway in, because of the inclusion of the additional pathway, we take a hit in the refinement statistics. But from uh, the standpoint in both cases, um, these are statistically identical fits. So these are the two structures that we can derive based on those initial um, XAVS models. So in one case, we have the Lewis acid bound to that cobalt oxygen. And in another case, we have the Lewis acid associated with the carbonyl on the ligand framework. Um, this, uh, just to point out with these particular metal oxo species, that oxygen isn't very Lewis basic. It's about as Lewis basic as these carbonyls. So um, either of these are equally valid places for that Lewis acid to bind based on the chemistry of these systems. Um, 
In this case, we can include in that multiple scattering pathway. In this case, that multiple scattering pathway is absent. So we can go through and look at the wavelet transform of these data. Um, so here um, you can see the wavelet transform and we can then go through, take our initial XAVs models for this species and this species as our starting refinement, and then go through and start to refine on the wavelet transform. And when we do that, it turns out that we need to include in this multiple scattering pathway here to get a really nice fit to the data. So that's where that cobalt scandium oxygen multiple scattering pathway shows up. When we don't include this in the refinements, um, and you can see that we don't have that out here, um, the statistics for this versus this on the wavelet transform um, really suffer. And because of this, we can conclude that this is really bound to this oxygen on this moiety here, uh, or, or uh, on the oxygen, on the cobalt oxygen moiety. And we find similar results when we look at other Lewis acids where um, all of those indicate that we're binding to that oxo. So this was a case where we could actually refine based on the um, wavelet transform. To show you a case where we can't refine based on the wavelet transform, I'm gonna talk about some intermediates formed and some organometallic transformation. So there's this reaction, the Poss and Kahn reaction, where essentially you can take an alkyne, an alkene, and CO and form these five-membered rings. And you can start with this cobalt um, carbonyl compound, make the acetylene type adduct, you can throw in an activator that does something to the compound, followed by your other hydrocarbon. Chemistry happens and you make this. And my collaborators and I decided that this chemistry step needed a little bit of clarification, so we started to investigate that using X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And there have been proposed mechanisms for this particular reaction. Um, unfortunately, those um, proposed mechanisms are all based on the stereochemistry of this product and very little actual hard experimental data in this chemistry step. So what we can do is we can preform the this compound here. We can add in our activator and wait 15 minutes or so for an intermediate to build up. We sample that out and freeze that. We then add in an unreactive alkene which slowly forms a sample that we then take out and freeze at a certain point. Um, this is what the XAVs data looks like, starting with the cobalt carbonyl and going through the activator sample A and sample B. And the XAVs is complex, um, complicating things beyond just this large glitch at about 2.2 K in the um, K cube data are just strong multiple scattering pathways from those COs. Um, we have all cobalt carbon based intersphere interactions which make things complicated and we can get lo a large number of valid plaus chemically plausible solutions to the XAVs data for samples A and B. So we turn to a wavelet transform analysis on this. And we can look at um, the uh, two-dimensional wavelet transform for the phenylacetylene compound, sample A, and sample B in this case. And what we unfortunately find is that the refinements on these data um, don't really give physically meaningful results. They all just go off the rails somewhere along the um, refinement. And that's just because of the large number of multiple scattering pathways that we have due to all of the various CO ligands, um, the tight diamond type core type structures and so on and so forth. So what we did was we used our initial XAV solutions. We determined some physically meaningful chemical structures on those. 
perform geometry optimizations using density functional theory uh, to generate a variety of plausible structures for A and B. Um, we then calculated the, what the XF spectrum should be for those and compared those to the wavelet transform data. So here for sample A, these are the three most valid possible models that we can think of for that particular sample. So in one case, um, we have this unbridged species where we have three COs on one cobalt, two COs on another. In another case, it's just this, but the act, another activator comes in and coordinates to that cobalt center. And then in a third case, we get a bridging CO between two cobalts that have two terminal COs ligated to those. And when we go through, we can start to um, generate wavelet transforms based on the XFs or based on the electronic structure data and score these against the actual experimental data. And what we find is that in this case, um, we get a very good match between the XAVS data and the predicted structure. And going through, um, we can use this to propose that this bridging CO is most likely for um, our first intermediate and then losing this CO bridge and binding in this alkene is most consistent for our um, second compound. Um, and this makes sense with some other um, spectroscopic data that's been obtained on these two intermediates. So this is a case where we're using a library of different generated structures. Um, in the last case that I'm gonna show, um, we um, examined this um, nickel iron sulfur cluster species. Um, so this uh, was a compound that um, we had obtained some um, XAVS data on years ago and had no idea what to do with it. So we figured, okay, we'll see how these types of compounds behave in a wavelet transform analysis. And this get, is a species that gives a really excellent fit to the XAVS data, probably the best fit that I've seen um, in my career. Um, so it kind of hurt that this was really a project that died, but the solution to this really just fell out. Um, here um, we have, can see the uh, nickel sulfurs, the nickel irons, um, the multiple scattering pathways um, due to some nickel sulfur iron interactions. Fits very nicely. If we go through and we look at the wavelet transform. Um, first off, we have trouble modeling the XAVS data based on the wavelet transform. And when we go through and we do this, and we keep this at the best case delta R, um, what we find is that we can approach that of a traditional um, uh, XAVS uh, analysis. Unfortunately, because we have to broaden out our data in delta or in K um, in order to achieve that resolution in R space, we can really put in an, any uh, phase and amplitude function for just a huge range of elements. Um, so as far as um, doing a structural analysis, if we get the resolution that will approach that of uh, traditional XAVS analysis, we completely lose all identity involving our atom type. If we try to improve our atom resolution, we completely um, lose all resolution in our space. And our refinements basically we can say that those nickel sulfur and nickel metal bond lengths are within whatever plus or minus one angstrom, which um, I think you could have given to any general chemistry student and they would have given you the same bond length range. And the improvement in um, being able to put in different phase and amplitude functions doesn't really get you much. Um, so 
this is an example where doing the analysis based on a wavelet transform really decreased your performance in comparison to a standard XAVS analysis. Um, so I'm going to now summarize um, just saying that we've implemented this Morlay wavelet transform and we've applied it to some discrete molecular systems. And the systems that we've examined have really fallen into three different classes of compounds. So we have really good compounds from our standpoint. These are things where we can get actual structural insight and be able to actually refine on the wavelet transform. And in general, the types of compounds that fall into um, this class of us being able to get insight and being able to solve for a wavelet transform or compounds that um, aren't really highly symmetric, um, but they do have some um, degree of symmetry. Um, the multiple scattering pathways aren't very complicated and there's something in the outer coordination sphere that really helps nail down the structure. Bad compounds, we see zero benefit of doing a wavelet transform analysis, and these are typically high symmetry compounds in our hands. Um, when we have something that's fairly high symmetry, um, doing a wavelet transform analysis doesn't really buy us anything. Um, and then ugly compounds, these are things where we have to resort to a library of structures, and these are compounds that are reasonably low symmetry, but have a huge amount of things going on in the outer coordination sphere and a lot of multiple scattering pathways. Um, and this is where uh, a large chunk of the compounds that we've studied have fallen. Um, as far as where this is going, um, essentially, um, this has been really a mixed bag for us. There's been cases where I think we've gotten some insight into some compounds, but other cases where it really hasn't been a huge benefit. So where we're going forward is we're really going to start to think about how to implement this FEF wavelet analysis. And where we're starting is to generate FEF wavelet functionals for doing XAVS data filtering. So um, essentially, just to give you an idea of where this is going and we're having trouble thinking about how to implement this best, but here uh, some simulated data and we can generate functionals based on a basically a FEF modified wavelet where as we scan through an R, we reach a maximum around the bond length that you would expect. Um, so we're, this is where we're going and really how we're trying to think about um, implementing this going ahead for these small molecular systems. So um, with that, I am done and I will take any questions. Thank you. Uh, you should right keep your keep your uh, projection up. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Toko, you have a you have a question. Um, hi. Um, so first of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's been very informative. Um, my question is not too complicated, uh, but I was kind of curious about your zanes for the uh, cobalt-4 complex. Yes. So I know you, you spoke about the appearance of the 1S to 3D peak, but I was kind of curious about the shoulder around 720. I guess it's one of the 1S to 4P uh, yeah. contributions, but I was just wondering what else contributes to that variation? Um, so, um, mo so are you talking about the, uh, the peak that's right here? Yes. That, yeah, okay. Right there. Um, so that is almost exclusively a cobalt 1S, the 4PZ transition right there. Okay. Um, so something to point out is that, um, although it's a change in formal oxidation state from a three to a four, as far as a change in physical oxidation state goes, um, it's really an incredibly minor change. So the edge shift is only on the order of about 0.3 electron volts going from that three to that four. So um, it, it, it's n once you start to get to these late transition metals, um, your oxidation state changes really aren't as pronounced as you see in the early um, first row transition metals.
Okay. All right. No, that was just my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt Newville, you had a question? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, so thanks, Jason. That was awesome. Uh, I have a couple of questions. In the in your compounds where you're showing or comparing the bridging oxygen or bridging carbonyl. Um, yeah. Isn't that um, really complex so yeah. yeah. Could, how different were the like just regular simulated X apps in K or R space? Um, not really. So um, let me think here. Um, so statistically not different at all. Visually um, there were differences and if you were just to go based on your visually looking at them um, you would say that uh, the species that gave the best wavelet transform matched the data well but um, it's they're really quite similar much more similar to one another than I would have predicted based on looking at these data here um, so we are seeing um, some reasonably pronounced differences in the wavelet transform um, that you do see those differences in the actual um, 1D data, but they're not as pronounced as you might think they are. Okay, okay. I actually have a, I have a separate or a follow-up question. Um, you said that for some of these, and not these, not these, this particular example, but for the next example, that the, that the matching, I'm not sure if you're doing fitting or not, but the matching of the wave, in wavelet transform was worse than in uh, Oh, oh, okay. Accepts. So, um, let me... So how, how, does, how is that possible? So let, <laughs> me, let, me clar let, let me clarify what I mean by worse. Um, um, the, the statistical match to the data isn't worse. What I meant by worse is the, um, is the refinement um, the the um, um, the um, the errors in your R values or um, going across or your ability to distinguish between scatterers. Um, so statistically, the refinements are, you know, fine. Um, they 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 look good from a statistical analysis. But as far as extracting um, your inf the structural information all at once based on one analysis um, that really is not nearly as good as the um, ah, okay. um, non wavelet data. In that case, you would have to do a wavelet transform um, getting high resolution in R, um, in which case you match the performance of just the standard XABS analysis, and then you'd do one where you get high resolution in K, and then you would match a standard XAS analysis, but you have to do it in two different refinements as opposed to just all at once. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I, I'm still, I'm still sort of interested in seeing why that is, but or you know what's causing that. But, but yes, that answers the question. Okay.